and Liz Joan. Rob Powers with sports. And Lee Goldberg with the exclusive AccuWeather forecast. Now, I witness the news at 6. I think it's a time for everyone to put aside political debates, put aside protests. Mayor de Balzio tonight calling for an end to anti-police protests. This is a stunned city mourns the tragic execution-style murders of two New York police officers and attempting to pave a peaceful future. De Blasio giving his strongest defense yet of the NYPD. The police and New Yorkers of every stripe tonight remembering the assassinated officers. Meanwhile, police also now searching new video of the killer as he arrived in Brooklyn to carry out his murders. And good evening, everyone, at 6 o'clock. I'm Bill Ritter. And I'm Liz Chung. Mayor de Blasio tonight urging New Yorkers to set aside their differences and instead focus on the grieving families of those two slain police officers. The mayor and police commissioner visiting the homes of officers Rafael Ramos and Wen Jin Liu to pay their respects today. A memorial near the murder scene in bed -Stuy. Well, tonight it is growing by the hour. Among those paying their respects, one of the daughters of Eric Garner. Meanwhile, the NYPD tonight still trying to put together the timeline of how the killer, Ishmael Brinsley, went from Maryland here to Brooklyn. As for the men he killed, funeral services for Officer Ramos have been scheduled for Saturday. He leaves behind a wife and two children. Funeral services for Officer Liu are now pending as the city tries to arrange for his family to arrive from China. He was married just two months ago, and just moments ago, his family spoke out. We would also like to express our condolences to the officer from his family. This is a difficult time for both of our families. But we will stand together and get through this together. A grief so profound, so raw still. We have several reports on these police shootings. We're going to begin with political reporter Dave Evans. He's at police headquarters for us tonight. Dave. Well, Liz, I think the mayor is having to walk a very fine line here, a tightrope, if you will, between showing support for the protesters these last couple of weeks who have demonstrated for police reform and at the same time showing police uh, support for them who are going through, of course, an especially difficult time. As we've seen these last couple of days, it's an awfully delicate balancing act. After virtually hiding yesterday, we saw lots of the mayor today. He visited the families of both slain officers, offered them consolation, and then he called for calm in the city from both protesters and police alike. Put aside political debates, put aside protests, put aside all of the things that we will talk about in due time. But in the coming days, Two families prepare for funerals. Two families try to think about how to piece their lives back together. Over the weekend, Mayor de Blasio faced a barrage of angry police officers who actually turned their backs on him. That blood on the hands starts on the steps of City Hall in the office of the mayor. Today, many people called that angry rhetoric from the unions wildly inflammatory. The blood is not on the hands of the mayor. The blood is on the hands of the sick person who committed the act. And late today, the mayor refused to duke it out with the unions. He called it inappropriate at this time. Uh, I will simply say I think uh, what he said was a mistake and it was wrong. But I'm not going to elaborate because we need to focus on the families. We need to focus on healing. The mayor also called for an end to protest, calling for police reform until at least after the funerals. So many people have looked at this weekend's tragedy and all the protests and grouped them together, saying you're either with police or against them. The mayor today called such thinking just plain wrong. Does that suggest that therefore police and community can never come together, that there always has to be a wall between them? No, we can't allow that. We cannot allow that. We have to keep working for harmony between police and community and for understanding. And today, the mayor did show one flash of anger, but it was at the media. He says they have portrayed a few bad protesters as the majority. You know what? You, I am telling you over again. I am telling you over again. That's how you want to portray the world, but we know a different reality. There are some people who do that. It's wrong. And it was interesting today, not only did the mayor call on protesters to halt their demonstrations until after the funerals, but also the police commissioner uh, here at police headquarters, he said that he had talked to the head of the five police unions. He's also asking for them to bring things down, make it a little quieter, stop all of the rhetoric until after the funerals. We'll see if that happens. For now, reporting live in lower Manhattan, Dave Evans, Channel 7.
I would just need time to build bridges. David, thank you. We are learning more tonight about the police officers who were gunned down. They represented in so many ways the diverse melting pot of a city they represented and were sworn to keep safe, or at least try. A growing memorial right now at the scene of their murders for officers Wenjan Liu and Rafael Ramos as we take a live picture of what it looks like in Bed-Stuy. I would just use Renee Stoll at the Ramos family home in Cypress Hills, Brooklyn, with that part of our cover. Good evening. We are actually standing a little further back from the home just to be respectful to this family and the roughly about 50 officers that came just about an hour ago, some of them carrying trays of food to be as helpful to this family as they can as they go through this tough time as they are with Wenjen Liu's family as well. Tonight, police cars lined the street. Officer Rafael Ramos lived on. Dozens from the NYPD family showed up this evening to pay respect and offer condolences to his family. We're learning more about Ramos and Officer Wenjen Liu tonight from some of the people that knew them best. Ramos was a 14-year member of the Christ Tabernacle Church near his home, where members say their pastors have been by the family's side since the news broke. He was purposely put front and center when he walked in the doors. That infectious smile. Uh, he was strategically positioned so that when people walked in, he was one of the first people you would encounter, and uh, in large part because of his ability just to connect with people and uh, make them feel at home. We are heartbroken as a church. As a volunteer usher, the pastor tells us Ramos was constantly seen helping his fellow church members. Whether he was ushering someone to their seats, helping a mom with a carriage or helping an elderly woman off the elevator. He was a gift uh, to our church. Mayor Bill de Blasio, his wife, and police commissioner William Bratton came to Ramos's home to speak to his family and also to the home of Wenjen Liu, where bouquets of flowers were left by neighbors. Governor Andrew Cuomo also went to Liu's home that his family said he purchased two years ago, fulfilling a dream, and shared it with his new bride. Cuomo said Liu's family is understandably having a hard time grasping what happened. It's all gone. Parents can't understand why uh, their son, who was the hero and was just trying to help people, uh, is gone, and there are no answers. Really probably the toughest part. Now, Ramos's church said that they are praying for the families of these slain officers, the entire NYPD force, and the city of New York to get through this, as I'm sure many others are. For now, we're reporting live in Cypress Hills, Brooklyn. Renee Stoll, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. We're going to think we're going to turn now to the killer, Ishmael Brinsley. And investigators know that he shot his ex-girlfriend near Baltimore before making a 200-mile trip on a bus to Brooklyn. Tonight, the NYPD is still trying to put together the timeline of exactly what he did before the shooting. So Howard News reporter Darla Miles continues our coverage. She's at police headquarters in Lower Manhattan. Darla. Liz, within the last 48 hours, investigators say what they have put together so far is a very disturbing picture of Ismael Brinsley. They say not only were his social media posts laced with despair and anti-government speech, they say on Saturday afternoon, he was walking around with a murder weapon in his hand in public. We're looking forward to identify that one piece of time where he was uh, in Brooklyn from about 12.07 hours to the to the time of occurrence, 14.47 hours. Police say this is Ismael Brinsley, casually walking around Atlantic Terminal Mall in Brooklyn with a murder weapon in a plastic takeout bag. We believe the gun was in that bag at that point. That's what we're thinking right now. Uh, it's a styrofoam container within that white bag. Investigators want anyone who may have seen Brinsley in Bedford-Stuyvesant or Fort Greene on Saturday afternoon to take a closer look at his green jacket. And if you recognize it, call police particularly i'd like you to focus on that patch with the indian arrowhead in red and white very distinctive they have now spoken to his former girlfriend Shanika thompson who police say he shot in the stomach in baltimore before heading to new york he put the gun to his own head when he broke into her apartment and then she talked him out of that and he later shot her before he left so um that's where we're going with that she said she'd never seen him with a gun before Investigators say they found 119 anti-government messages like this one on social media. All of this part of putting together the final hours before police say Brinsley shot officers Wenjin Liu and Rafael Ramos with little warning. We owe it to the family to find out what happened, and that's our main concern here. 
Now, investigators say they have also recovered Brinsley's cell phone in Baltimore. They say on that cell phone they have video of an anti-police demonstration in Union Square on December 1st. They say he only appears to be observing the demonstration and that he was not participating in the protest. Reporting live in Lower Manhattan, Darla Miles, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Interesting. Darla, thank you. All the political debates aside, this assassination of two New York police officers sparking a change in policy protectively for the NYPD. No cops alone or on foot or in their squad car anymore. And no auxiliary police officers allowed to patrol, at least for now, because they're not armed. I would assume reporter Tim Fleischer for that part of our coverage. He's at a police precinct in Queens. Tim. And Bill, they, as you point out, are vigilant on a number of different fronts. Whether the foot patrols come out of precincts like this one here in Flushing, they're going to be doubling up. The same holds true if they go out on a call in a patrol car. But there is also heightened awareness when it comes to social media. 18-year-old Devin Coley is being charged with making terroristic threats after police discovered his Facebook postings. In the wake of the killing of two NYPD officers ambushed as they sat in their patrol car. It's a very dangerous situation right now. Joseph Giacalone, former NYPD detective, professor, and author, says social media is a real game changer. The gunman, Ismail Brinsley, had vowed in an Instagram post to put, quote, wings on pigs, end quote, as retaliation for the slayings of black men at the hands of white police. The NYPD is now investigating dozens of similar threats. There have been copycat threats. Uh, anything like that needs to be taken very seriously. I just want to emphasize that the simplest thing any New Yorker can do is call 911. The heightened level of awareness is equally stressed here in the precincts. Effective immediately, according to an internal memo, all footposts are to be assigned in pairs. There are to be no solo footposts citywide. All uniformed members of service shall arrive and remain on post together. Policing is full of inherent dangerous, but now even more so than ever because not only have the threats been out there, but they've actually enacted on them now. And auxiliary police, who are not issued a service weapon, should not be used on patrol until further notice. Their vehicles sitting idle at precincts. This is going to go on for a long period of time, and unfortunately the good people of the community is one's going to suffer because police response is going to slow down. And they'll be doing it, they say, for their own safety. Reporting live in Flushing, Tim Fleischer, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Tim, thank you. Meanwhile, here on Friday, 2 o'clock to 9 p.m. at Christ Tabernacle Church. This is at Queens. His funeral will be at the same place on Saturday at 10 in the morning. And we invite you to stay with Eyewitness News and 7 Online as we continue to follow these tragic murders of two New York police officers. We're going to turn now to the other news of the night.